Jason here. Welcome to our live week in review where we will discuss the last seven founders I wrote about on founderoftheday.com. Still trying to figure out exactly when the live part starts, but here I am. It's on my screen now, so I am live. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to get into it real quick this week. Not going to spend too much time on it. Everyone who's here, thanks for coming. As people trickle in, just a reminder, what we're doing is we're looking at the last three founders of the day, a.k.a. from last Thursday to today, uh, the founders I wrote articles about. And I'm going to talk about what I learned about these people this week. And it's a little bit different this week because, you know, 4th of July happened. I don't know why I put it in quotes. 4th of July definitely happened this week. Uh, so... We're going to talk about that a little more than usual, uh, in particular. Uh, but let's get into it. Thank you for coming. If you guys want to hit like while you're coming in, I would really appreciate that. Let's get going. So, last Thursday, I wrote about Alexander Lillington. Now, I'll be honest, Lillington is one of those founders that I have a half-written article on my desk for, like, weeks, because I just can't find the story. Again, when I write these articles, I'm trying to figure out What's the story? What makes this person different than anyone else? What makes this founder not special, but like, how can we give them their own story? Lillington, I just couldn't figure out, couldn't figure out, couldn't figure out. Finally, I kind of conceded, as I've said before, if I spend enough time on a particular founder, I have to write that article. I can't spend three hours researching a person and then not write the article. And usually the ones I spend the most time on are the most difficult. But anyway, not that I'm complaining. Um, Lillington, I finally just wrote about what I didn't want to write, which was the battle he was involved in. But you know what? It's always nice to review some things. So, first of all, the real thing about Alexander Lillington that we want to l remember is, uh, what was his name? So, his name has appeared as Alexander John Lillington in a lot of places. But it's also appeared as John Alexander Lillington in a lot of places. And historians aren't really quite sure what his name was. There weren't really birth certificates to reference back then. So, we call him here Alexander Lillington, because that is what he's known as, but we will never know what his real name actually was. What we do know about him is uh, he had joined, uh, he was already a militiaman for North Carolina when the American Revolution broke out. He had some experience in previous fighting, uh, and then when the Revolutionary War uh, did break out, he was named as a colonel uh, for the Wilmington District Militiamen. Now, uh, he was soon recruited by uh, James Moore, who we talked about not too long ago, to fight with Richard Caswell, who we talked about not too long ago. James Moore, uh, unfortunately, would die pretty early on of natural causes and was a great loss to the future American founding. But uh, Richard Caswell uh, was another founder, a future governor of North Carolina, and Caswell and Lillington joined forces with their militias at the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge. The Battle of Moores Creek Bridge is a fascinating event because it was in February of 1776, uh, just after uh, Thomas Paine published Common Sense, still uh, a month before George Washington kicked the British out of Boston, and the Continental Army was in Boston trying to get rid of the British. So this battle breaks out down south, and what's interesting is they attack a group of, of British soldiers and loyalists, uh, loyalist militia, at the Battle of Great Bridge, and it's a surprise attack, and the Americans are able to kill four, I'm not, not kill, but they were, uh, distribute 400 casualties and capture 850 prisoners. Meanwhile, they only had one person killed. It's an astounding victory earlier in the war, down in North Carolina, where, again, the attention isn't really being paid quite yet. There, of course, were British soldiers there. There were British soldiers throughout the colonies, uh, in addition to loyalists who signed up to fight against these terrible rebels. Um, but the Battle of Moore Creek, Moore's Creek Bridge is one of the outstanding achievements of the American Revolution so early in the war. And, <coughs> excuse me, it really is the crowning moment of Lincoln's career, which made him so difficult to talk about. When I finally wrote this article, it is pretty much based on Battles of Moore Creek Bridge. From there, Ling Lillington does go on to uh, fight in the war. He joins, he leaves the militia and goes to the Continental Army for a brief period, but then he leaves the Continental Army to go back to the North Carolina militia because the North Carolina militia had appointed him as a brigadier general, and that was simply an office he could not turn down. Uh, he survives throughout the war uh, and continues to fight in the Southern Department before retiring to private life. He doesn't from my research, didn't really do much after the war uh, politically. So that is the life 
of Alexander Lillington. Uh, we got that one out of the way. Now we're going to get to some of the fun ones. Um, I'm going to check real quick, see if there's any questions or comments. Not yet, but thank you for coming. If you guys do have questions or comments, that's why we're doing this live video. Um, so on Friday, I published an article about the Declaration of Independence. What I did is I did something similar a few years ago. I literally took, hey Frank, welcome. You only missed Alexander Lillington. There wasn't a lot going on. Um, but on Friday, I published an article where I took the 27 complaints in the Declaration of Independence and just listed them out super plain spoken. I think it's really hilarious. Part of me thinks it's hilarious that you have uh, the Declaration of Independence. The first three paragraphs are, as I said in a video last week, humongously important to the history of the world from there on out. But then after the first three paragraphs and all their importance, you have just a bunch of paragraphs where they're literally complaining. <laughs> like They call them grievances, but they're essentially complaining about the king. So what I did is I just listed the complaints. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to run through them really quick, and then I'm going to note something that was a major reason for the American Revolution that they conveniently left out. So see if you can figure it out. So <clears throat> I'm going to go as quick as I can. Uh, the king refused to let colonists pass basic laws. He closed down colonial governments. He threatened to only pass laws if they gave up their ability to participate in the governments. He made the representatives of the people meet in times and places that were nearly impossible to get to. He shrugged off legitimate complaints. He dis his disillusion of the government prevented the correction of economic problems and left the colonies open for invasion. Uh, the king stopped colonists from being able to attract new settlers. He refused to appoint judges, which hurt the rule of law. The judges that were appointed were paid by the king, and therefore did what he wanted instead of doing what was right. He made pointless offices as a reason to send people to North America just to give the colonists trouble. He gave dictatorial powers to generals that used military to suppress cities. They're talking about Boston at that point. Uh, he filled the streets with a police force whose procedures they had no control over. The king worked with parliament to create laws that were unconstitutional. Instead of putting soldiers in forts, they were stationed in homes, which is only kind of half true. Um, when the soldiers committed crimes, they were protected from punishment. The king and parliament cut off trade with the rest of the world. They implemented taxation without representation. They took away the benefits of trial by jury. They made, up cr they made up crimes and took citizens across the Atlantic Ocean for trial. They set up Quebec with French laws while expanding its territory all the way to the Midwest, which seemed to be an example of what they might expect in the future. They took away the charters which created the colonies, ending a long tradition of colonies controlling their own affairs. They claimed control in all laws, in all situations. The king had proven he was no longer their leader by starting a war against them. He was, uh, the war destroyed communities. He hired a bunch of Germans to come to America to kill a British people because they thought of themselves as British. Uh, he captured citizens and forced them to fight against their families. And he turned the people against themselves and he convinced Native Americans to attack the colonists. So that is the 27 grievances in the Declaration of Independence. Um, I'll note a few things and then I do want to think, uh, there is, I do see some comments so I will check that real quick. Uh, many people don't know about those grievances, yeah. Hello, Mr. Range Overland. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, top of the evening to you as well. Um, you're right, Frank. Most people, a lot of people don't really, a lot of people don't read the Declaration of Independence. As I say every year, and I said a bunch of times this week, hey, give it a read. It's really interesting. Um, I do want to point some, a few things out. Uh, first of all, taxation without representation, right? That's what we always hear, is like, that's why they fought this revolution. Of the 27 grievances, that's number 17. That's pretty far down the list. It was extremely important to many of the founders, but it was not the number one reason for most of the founders. In fact, the number one reason, and, and again, this is a paraphrase of it. I should have pulled up the declaration while I was saying this, but the number one reason was the king refused to let colonists pass basic laws. He had stopped them from governing themselves and not just like oh he won't let us govern ourselves but like stop them from governing at all and they saw this as anarchy and there might be some an anarchists in the crowd today who knows but back then anarchy was a big no-no these were men who very much cared about the rule of law 
uh, uh, and I mentioned examples, and I will continue to mention examples, uh, so keep watching, S make sure you subscribe. <laughs> um, what's very interesting also is um, what's not here, and this is one of the most important reasons that the Revolutionary War was fought, especially for the South, especially from the wealthy landowners in Virginia, and that is land. After the French and Indian War, the king announced the Proclamation of 1763, which drew a line down the colonies and said, you cannot expand any further. This is territory for Native Americans. In hindsight, yeah, the king was really just trying to make sure that the Native Americans and the colonists didn't go to war with each other. Seems obvious. But many of the wealthy Virginians, like, you know... George Washington and Richard Henry Lee and uh, Patrick Henry to a degree and and all the Virginians, <laughs> except maybe Jefferson, uh, were involved in one of several land companies that bought land in the Ohio Valley region. The Ohio Valley region consists of Ohio and parts of like Western Pennsylvania, modern West Virginia, modern Western Virginia, um, uh, Northern Kentucky, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, Tennessee could be included in that. And this area was ripe for settling. And not only that, but it went to the Mississippi River. The Ohio River went down to the Mississippi River. This was supposed to be where America was going to push settlers out, uh, build communities, uh, farm and produce, and ship it out to sea. Uh, additionally, the men in Virginia who owned this land were going to make a tidy fortune selling it to settlers. And when the king issued the proclamation line, Whoa, what do you mean we can't profit off this land? So, that was a very important reason for Virginians to go to war, and it's conveniently left off the list on the Declaration of Independence, something I did not know until I reread it, or notice until I reread it again this year. It is fascinating that they kind of kept that off the list when it was one of the most important points, but it looks pretty greedy, doesn't it? If you're saying we're throwing off the king, because we want to make money. So I can see how it was conveniently omitted. <laughs> now again, you're watching this channel, you've seen me this past week, you know I love the Declaration of Independence, so it's not, um, I'm not, I'm trying to be objective and open-minded when I review it, so I had to point that out. Still love it, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I do see comments coming in, I think you guys are just saying what's up to each other. Uh, rule of law is important. Hey guys, hi nachos. How is everyone? Great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for hitting liking and subscribing. Blah, 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 blah. Let's move on a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. To Stephen Hopkins. Uh, on the weekends, I always republish two old articles. And this weekend, I published articles about two declaration signers. In fact, the article I published about Stephen, Hawk oh, Stephen Hopkins focuses on uh, one of his quotes. And I don't have it with me, but I have a mug and a t-shirt and uh, stickers for sale on my shop, click the link below, that say, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Now, I'm going to brief this story, because I have other things about Stephen Hopkins I'd like to talk about, but Hopkins, when he signed the Declaration of Independence, was a ripe old man who had what they called was palsy, and he shook. And when he signed the Declaration, if you look at the copy of it, he has the shakiest signature in the world. And what he said when he was holding his hand to write his name on the Declaration of Independence, he said to the crowd, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. It's one of my favorite quotes from American history. I really love it. Uh, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Actually, what we're going to talk about is Stephen Hopkins and his rival, uh, uh, Samuel Ward. So there were two parties in Rhode Island leading up the decades leading up to the American Revolution. And Stephen Hopkins had been in politics for almost 45 years before the Revolution began. And throughout this time, Samuel Ward had also been in politics for about 45 years. And no joke, for about 20 years, one would be governor and the other would be uh, chief justice of the colonial Supreme Court. And then the chief justice would run against the governor and win and become governor. And then the governor would become chief justice. And they kept switching those two positions. The separate political parties, there was like a country, I forget the names of them, but there was like a city party and a country party, essentially. And they kept switching positions for 20 years. They were rivals. One was chief justice. One was governor. Swippity swap. And then, well, things start getting weird. You know, revolution is approaching. 
and it was in 1764, the year before the Stamp Act Congress, that Stephen Hopkins writes, uh, uh, publishes a, 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 an essay called The Rights of the Colonies Explained. Um, I'm sorry, The Rights of the Colonies Examined, where he actually goes in depth and looks at what it means. What is the relationship between the colonies and the mother country, and what should it be? Because at this point, there were certain taxes that had started coming along, and, and the French and Indian War had just concluded. The government was starting to put out new taxes, but ones that weren't quite so bad. So it was, before anyone else got together for the Stamp Act, before most people started writing, before John Dickinson writes Farmer Refuted, and, and Thomas Paine comes along a decade later, Stephen Hopkins writes the first critique of what the British, they're kind of doing some things wrong, aren't they? And what's extraordinary about this is he was sitting governor of Rhode Island when he wrote it. And because of that, it was published by the colonial government of Rhode Island and sent to all the other colonies. Rhode Island was extremely small back then as it is today, but it was an amazing, amazingly important part of the revolution. It was essentially, there are many places that were the heart of the revolution, but it was, it was, it was the beat of the heart of the revolution in many aspects. I mean, these... These guys wouldn't even come to the Constitutional Convention because they didn't like big government. <laughs> um, but that's 20 years later. So, he writes this, years go by, Stamp Act happens. I did actually forget to mention that uh, Stephen Hopkins had gone to the Albany Conference of 1754 that Ben Franklin called together, where a bunch of the northern states came together to discuss what uh, the colonies could do with the French and Indian War obviously approaching, how can we get together and defend ourselves together as a greater force? Uh, that didn't work out. They came up with a plan. The king didn't like it. Didn't happen. But it's interesting, that conference had uh, several, I believe, four signers of the Declaration at it 22 years beforehand, and also had several Loyalist leaders at it. Um, but again, uh, 10 years after that, Stephen Hopkins writes, The Rights of the Colonies Examined. And 10 years after that, he's attending the first Continental Congress. And who comes with him? S Samuel Ward, his rival, for 40 years, the head of the other political party. Because what Britain was doing in the eyes of Rhode Islanders was so extreme that the two leaders of the political parties both got together, <laughs> rode in a carriage all the way to Philadelphia to work as a team to deny independence. And sadly... Samuel Ward would pass away in March of 1776, just before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And the one thing that these gentlemen ever really agreed on was both independence should be had. So, when, C when Stephen Hopkins was signing the Declaration of Independence with his shaky hand, he was essentially doing it for both himself and his colony and his rival, who they had finally come together on something, and uh, sadly Steve Sa Samuel Ward passes away just before him. But, moving on to the next day's founder is William Ellery. When Samuel Ward passed away, well, someone needed to replace him, and they chose William Ellery. William Ellery was essentially a, uh, not a politician, a, a clerk. He wasn't essentially a clerk. He was a clerk of the General Assembly for most of his career. He was a merchant and lawyer and very successful, um, but he worked as a customs collector. He worked as a court. He was just kind of a bureaucrat. <laughs> and because of that, they said, hey, we got to replace Samuel Ward. Why don't you go, William? And he did. And he got there just in time. Again, Samuel Ward dies in March. Uh, Ellery gets there over the summer. And I'll remind you that the signing, even though we're talking about it 4th of July week, uh, the signing of the Declaration was August 2nd, 1776. So William Ellery's there in time for that, and he sits down, and he takes a very peculiar seat. William Ellery decides, you know what? I am going to sit next to Secretary Charles Thompson, because it was on Thompson's desk facing out that everyone signed the Declaration. And Ellery wanted to make sure, looking in everyone's faces as they signed the Declaration, what they looked like while they were signing their death warrant. He wanted to see if they knew the gravity of the situation, and... Fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, he, they seemed to. They seemed to notice what was happening. They seemed to know the gravity. Now, that's really the, 
I jumped into William Ellery real quick because that's pretty much his story. Uh, he does stick around in the uh, Continental Congress for several years and does also sign the Articles of Confederation. So he was part of creating the initial government of the United States. After that, he goes back to Rhode Island, becomes a public servant. He does make his way up. See, signing the Declaration of Independence will give you some credibility in your local government of your state. Uh, so although he didn't really participate in the federal level after that, he went right up in the state level and became a justice of the Supreme Court of his uh, of Rhode Island. After that, some years go by, Rhode Island doesn't want to join the Union, but then eventually relents, and George Washington needs to pick someone to act as um, the, the customs collector for the port of Newport in Rhode Island. One of, if not the uh, major cities in Rhode Island. I know saying that today doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Most of Rhode Island cities are comparatively smaller than major cities, but at the time, both Providence and Newport were extraordinarily important uh, cities with, with their port. They were whaling cities and, and shipping cities. He was a merchant. He knew the trade. He had acted as custom collector <clears throat> Excuse me, during the colonial era, so he was a good choice. Additionally, since Rhode Island, they didn't even vote for a while to have a ratification convention. They had a referendum, and the Constitution says you need to have a convention, and they didn't. They had a referendum, which meant everyone just voted, and everyone voted, no thanks, and then years go by, and it's almost two years into Washington's presidency before Rhode Island finally ratifies the Constitution and shows up. They were real late to the game. <laughs> real late to the game. And because of this, Washington had a little bit of difficulty choosing someone to take over as customs collector, but, you know, William and Ellery signed the declaration, and he had been a bureaucrat all this time, and he was a justice of the Supreme Court, and had experience as a customs collector, so he was a perfect candidate. And actually, uh, he accepts the position and becomes a customs collector at the Port of Newport, and is there for 30 years, almost 30 years, for the remainder of his life, until he dies at 92 years old. That's William Ellery, and I've, of all the founders who signed the declaration, that is the most complete <laughs> explanation of his life you're ever going to find. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for liking. I really appreciate everyone for everything. Um, uh, Founder of the day, can you research how many people were enslaved by the 10 Republicans? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the 10 Republicans. I don't know if that's a meme that I have yet to become aware of. Um, there were a lot of slaves owned. A very in brief... Um, out of 2.5 million or so people living in the United States, about 500,000 or a fifth of all people were slaves. Um, cool. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. I am talking really fast. Uh, for those of you new here, I do have to stop and sip on a drink every once in a while. Which is embarrassing, but Usually these last about an hour, and I am talking my heart's content. So, we are going to talk about James Scammon. I think it's pronounced Scammon. Uh, ten Republicans are said to own slaves. Um, no. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm still not entirely sure what you mean by that. Uh... If you're talking about Democratic Republicans from back in the day, significantly more than 10 of them owned slaves. I can assure you of that. Um, if you're making a reference to modern politics, I do not discuss modern politics on this channel. I do my best to avoid it because I don't think it's as much fun as the American Revolution. <laughs> Continue on, but thank you for watching. I really appreciate you coming. And, and if uh, it is a question about the revolution, you want to elaborate more, I'll be happy to discuss it. Absolutely. Um, James Scammon. I stumbled onto James Scammon's name when I was researching another person and it was just a little blurb about him and I was like, who is this? And I tried to research more. There wasn't much more than this little blurb. So I don't know a ton about James Scammon. He is one of the super random founders that uh, I, I like to cover once in a while because there are so many stories about so many founders who did so many things and there are some founders who were just so obscure and I, I personally think they're super interesting. So all I really know about this guy is he got court-martialed. <laughs> um, he was from New Hampshire uh, and he, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm, I'm talking my, my lungs out. <laughs> uh, he was not from New Hampshire. He was from Maine, which at the time was still a part of Massachusetts. 
So technically, even though he was in Maine and joined a Maine militia, he joined a Massachusetts militia in the aftermath of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and he went south to join the siege on Boston. Now, he arrived just in time for the Battle of Bunker Hill. Unfortunately, he took control of his men, and he went to a place called, I think it's pronounced, Lechmere's Point, L-E-C-H-M-E-R-E. -E. I have trouble pronouncing some things. Bear with me. Uh, it's either Lechmere's Point, Lechmere's Point, Lechmere's Point. I'm calling it Lechmere's Point. That's how I read it. He went to Lechmere's Point, and nothing happened there. It's insignificant. <laughs> either way, nothing was happening there, but he ran into another general whose name was uh, John Whitcomb. He was actually a colonel, but he was acting as a general at the time because George Washington had not made it to Boston by the time of Lexington, uh, I'm sorry, by the time of uh, uh, Bunker Hill. So it was still a really ragtag army, wasn't the Continental Army yet, and people were just trying to follow orders. Uh, Artemis Ward had taken over as Major General uh, and was in charge, and everyone was defaulting to him, even though really they didn't have to. The Massachusetts men really sh were supposed to, but, you know, there were people from Rhode Island and New Hampshire and Connecticut uh, and even New York who didn't have to, but they were. Either way, it was a little bit chaotic. So... Uh, he takes his men to Lechmere's Point, runs into this guy, Whitcomb. Now, there is some contradiction as to what took place during this conversation. Now, he did default to uh, uh, Whitcomb's orders, but what Whitcomb said is in question. So, uh, according to Whitcomb, he said, told Scammon to go where he could do the most service. But what his men heard was, go to the nearest hill. Now, as for what the nearest hill was, uh, it, I believe it was an unnamed hill that was just up uh, about a mile from Bunker Hill. Now, so, uh, this apparently is what Scammon thought he heard also. So, Scammon brings his men to uh, the hill, and they're there, and nothing's going on. They were trying to find a place to prevent British from landing. Nothing was happening. So, he sent some scouts out to Bunker Hill to see if they needed his help. He didn't hear from them. It was only a mile. Should have been there and back pretty quick. They didn't come back quick enough, so he decides to just go to Bunker Hill. He arrives at Bunker Hill just as everyone's retreating, and they're basically like, get out of here. Now, to his credit, Scammon did attempt to go up Bunker Hill despite retreating troops to help hold back the British, but when the last of the Patriots were retreating and they're like, there's no one there, you're, you're, it's a suicide mission. And he was like, okay, he relented, and they backed off. Unfortunately, uh, George Washington comes to town a month later, takes control of the Continental Army. He's trying to get everything under control, trying to restore order. Washington, um, one of the his his most uh, one of the things most important to him as a general was order. As I said before, law and order was very important to these men. Um, and general and Washington would um, at times during the war be uh, brutal with his treatment of his own soldiers for usually things like desertion and stuff like that. But he had several court martials to make up for things he had missed, and and um, excuse me. Uh, uh, Scammon was accused of backwardness in the execution of his duty, uh, by which was meant Whitcomb had essentially gone and told everyone, "Hey, I told him to go to Bunker Hill. I told him to go where he do the most service. Obviously, that was Bunker Hill. Maybe if he went, we would have won the battle." And Scammon. And many of his men testified, no, that's not what he said. He said, go to the nearest hill. So we did, and nothing was going on there, and that was dumb. So I wanted to go where I would do the most service. <laughs> um, so he ends up, thankfully, Scammon is found not guilty by the court-martial, and he is allowed to continue with the Continental Army, although he resigns at the end of 1775, which is early in the war, yes, but many people did. They had enlisted for several reasons, not Throughout the war, it wasn't just one army the whole time. At certain points, people would leave, their enlistments would end, they would leave, other people would enlist. Some people kept re-enlisting. A lot of the officers we know, especially the higher rank or, ranking ones, stayed for a long time. But many of the rank and file men were in and out of the army uh, the whole time. So he did leave, and, and keep in mind, these were regular people who had jobs and lives and families they had to hang out with. Um, so that is uh, 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 James Scammon. Probably a name you will never hear again for the rest of your life. Uh, but I thought it was great. I did see some comments and questions coming in. Uh, no, 
Thatcher's. Thank you for your understanding. The Whigs ended in 1854 and the Republican Party was founded in 1854. I know a little about the Whigs. I, I'm with you. Um, I didn't know if you were referencing that, that time period. Um, Matthew, thank you for coming. Uh, Lechmere, let Lechmere, because it's spelled the same as the department store. Holy moly, I didn't even make that connection. That's great. Well, it's officially Lechmere. Fortunately, the story's over, and we will never hear of James Scammon ever again. But thank you, Matthew, for coming and showing up. I want to give a big shout-out to my Patriots on Patreon, uh, of which Matthew was one, and he was kind enough to bring my attention to a woman named Elizabeth Junell uh, last weekend and sent me some articles about her, and I appreciate it because I had known the name for a reason we'll get into at the end, but I had never really learned about her whole story. Uh, and digging into her life was fascinating because... She was, okay, she was born into poverty in Rhode Island. I'm talking a lot about Rhode Island today. That was an accident, I assure you. Um, she was born into poverty. Uh, her father died while she was young. Uh, her mother brought her, she lived in a brothel for a little while as a child. Um, whether her mother was a prostitute or not is up in the air. Maybe, she lived in a brothel. Um, we don't believe she, that, uh, Eliza Jumel, who as a child was born Eliza Bowen, she had several name changes throughout her life, uh, we don't believe the young Miss Bowen was a prostitute, uh, when she comes of age, there is accusations she was, uh, there's also rumors that she had married briefly to a sailor and had a child that was given up for adoption, again, all rumors, there are a lot of rumors in her life and we will get to why. But she does, what is a fact, is she goes to New... She moves around New England a little bit as a child, and then she ends up going to North Carolina. And when she comes of age, she moves to New York City. And she becomes a um, an entertainer. There was one, maybe at this point a second one, but one theater in New York City, and she became essentially an extra in the theater. Uh, she may have also worked odd jobs primarily as, as a... Uh, 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 a maid, more or less, the actual terminology escapes me, I apologize, but a, a housemaid. Um, and then, she finds a man. Now, I never like to put the women I write about in the context of the men they marry. And thankfully, Jumel does not need that qualification. Um, but, uh, it is noteworthy because we call her Eliza Jumel. The reason is she married a gentleman named Stephen Jumel. What's interesting about Stephen Jumel is he was a he was French, and he was a merchant and was pretty successful. And he came to the United States and also changed his name because I forgot to mention that when she first moved to New York, Eliza Bowen changed her name to Eliza Brown, and then she got married and changed her name to Eliza Jumel, which really is the last name change. There's perhaps another one, but we'll get to that anyway. She marries this Frenchman. They end up uh, living in sin for several years before they get married, which was, you know, scandalous. She ends up having a much, a pretty scandalous life because they move to France. Uh, she starts becoming a patron of the arts, which is was a new thing at the time, really. Uh, she was started becoming an art collector and paying a lot of money for an art collection that over the 90 years of her life would become the, probably the most substantial in New York City. Why New York City? Because she only stays in France about a year. She moves back to New York City and leaves her husband behind. And she begins running the New York City branch of his business. The French branch actually starts to fail, but the New York City branch, she is more or less the owner of, and one of the only first and only business women in 1790s, early 1800s, 1810s, New York City. She makes a lot of money. She makes a lot of enemies uh, because if you're a tenacious business person of any any nature, uh, you are usually going to make some enemies. I understand. Not really a business person, but my understanding from cinema is that business people can make enemies. Um, and if you're a woman in the early 1800s, you're going to make a lot of enemies. And she did and seemed to kind of like it. She made a ton of money. She had a great business. Um... Uh, after several years, her husband does end up dying. She lives on her own for a while, and then she gets married. And here's the kicker. She remarries to a gentleman in 1830s named Aaron Burr. Yeah. 30 years after the duel with Alexander Hamilton, a 77-year-old Aaron Burr 
remarries to an Eliza Jumel. Now, we don't know why, if it was really for love. Actually, Matthew, we were part of a Twitter conversation, uh, I believe just yesterday, regarding, uh, you know, the what was it? The first marriage is for love, second is for money, third is for companionship. Uh, this one seems to be a little bit of uh, companionship and some money. Because she had money, and he used to have money, but he also had reputation. Of course, Aaron Burr's reputation was scarred, but as decades went by and he went back to New York and just became a regular lawyer in New York, he was a former vice president of the United States, and he did have his reputation restored to a degree within the citizens of New York, and he pretty much kept himself, too, living in New York. So, her, as New York's top businesswoman, this was a... If we're on television, it would be a match made in heaven. <laughs> um, but, uh, apparently, it was not a great match, because within... Four months they were separated, and within the year they had gotten a divorce. And here is why we do not know a lot of truth about Eliza Jumel's early life. Both sides threw slander at each other, because you could only get a divorce in New York at the time if someone was being adulterous. And so they were trying to prove that they had cheated on each other. And some of what I read is absolutely hilarious, because she's basically saying he hooked up with this girl in my house, uh, or, or in our house, one of our major, a friend, or I, I forget exactly who the woman was uh, that he allegedly hooked up with. And Aaron Burr, at this point, was going on 78 and said, nature, nature would not let me do that anymore. <laughs> like, like, I can't, can't, not anymore. I mean, this is a family channel, so I'm keeping it as clean as I can. But <laughs> you understand my drift. He literally said, not anymore, man. <laughs> like, so, uh... But he also wanted a divorce, too, so he threw accusations of a similar kind at her. Also, they were a famous celebrity couple in New York City, so gossip started spreading, and they were adding fuel to the fire, so all these untruths came out. Additionally, after the divorce, which, by the way, they did get divorced, and it was finalized on the day Aaron Burr died. Oof. Sorry, Mr. Vice President. Tough go of it. Anyway, she lived... Uh, a lot more time. She actually died in 1765. She lived to be 90 years old and saw the Civil War, believe it or not. Um, outlived Hamilton by, uh, I'm sorry, Burr by 30 years. She, uh, in her older days, was known to be a little kooky. Uh, she liked to make up stories and exaggerate her early life, which, or in, she exaggerated her entire life, but mostly her early life, which again is why we don't really know. Like, did she have a child in her early 20s? Was she a prostitute? Or was that a story she liked to tell? It's really complicated. And it is, again, she is a fascinating character. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, Mr. Muscle Man, don't worry about being late. These things happen. You can go back and watch what you missed. But thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, and thank you again, Matthew, for that recommendation. I was... Yeah. I get a lot of recommendations. And usually the, they're like family members and stuff, which I, I love doing. I have a lot of fun with it. And they're obscure and they're hard to research. This is the first one where it was like, oh, there's so much information on this lady. And, like, I had known the name because, you know, I, I there's a Burr book I've recommended a ton of times. I've read several Burr books, and she's at the end of all of them. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so I, uh, again, any questions? Here I am. And we are kind of flying through today. We're already at the last one. Where are we at? 38 minutes. Okay, nope. It just feels like it's flying because I'm having a good time. Thank you for coming, everyone. We're going to talk about John Nixon. Now, caveat here. While I was reading, uh, when I was researching this particular John Nixon, there was another John Nixon who lived through the Revolutionary War, and he was, uh, I didn't really read about him. I saw him and said, I'm not going to confuse my, stay on track, man, stay on track. <laughs> Getting distracted, I, I tend to, like, oh, a new founder I never heard of, let's go. <laughs> um, so that John Nixon was uh, an officer, I believe, in the, in the Massachusetts militia, maybe New Hampshire, but I think it was Massachusetts. Again, didn't look into him. Didn't want to get two John Nixons in my head, of all things. It's one thing to get distracted with some other founder, but two dudes with the same name. No, 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 no. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> um, John Nixon was born to a wealthy Philadelphia family. We're done with Rhode Island. We're talk about Philly. Uh, he was born to a wealthy Philadelphia family. They uh, had a romping good time, and he went into the family business, became a merchant, and early on became an opponent of British indiscretions, so to speak. Uh, John Nixon, I've already confused myself with the two John Nixons. Uh, so John Nixon of Philadelphia, uh, after the Stamp Act was a signed the uh, a boycott on trade, the first one, 
after the Stamp Act uh, uh, Congress in 1765. He would be an early member of Philadelphia's Committee of Correspondence, and he would also be an early member of the Committee of Safety. And the Committee of Correspondence, as a reminder, uh, each state and many towns had committees of correspondence so that they could be ready at a moment's notice. Everyone knew what was going on everywhere. They, that was like the, the, the communications arm of the revolution. Committees of safety were, for safety, they were organizing the militia to make sure they were ready to go at a moment's notice, but also were essentially, once the revolution began and the colonial governments were dissolved, the committees of safety became the shadow governments that ran the colonies until independence was declared and new constitutions were drawn up. And he was, John Nixon was a member of both. Also, uh, he joined the Philadelphia Associators. Oh, I always want to say it wrong. The Philadelphia Associators, which was basically the city militia. It was one of Pennsylvania's most important militias. And uh, he would go and help Washington with, um, he'd be in several battles, including the battles of Princeton and Trenton. It was famous hugely important battles early in the war. He would also spend some time at Valley Forge with George Washington. But he went back home in July of 1776. And it just so happens that he was home right as the Declaration of Independence was getting voted on, signed, and printed. And when it was printed, someone needed to read it. And, oh, what day is it? Today is July 8th, 2020. I had to look at what year it was. Oh, my God. Uh -huh. J July 8th, 2020. So I don't always do this. I probably should do it more. But on this day in 1776, John Nixon was handed a copy of the original printing of the Declaration of Independence and stood on the steps of the Pennsylvania State House, which we now know as Independence Hall. And he gave the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence to private citizens in the history of the Declaration of Independence. It is quite an honor. I was a little bit surprised I didn't know about him. Again, someone recommended I cover him on this channel, and I forget who. I think it was Matthew, but it might have been Muscle Man. I don't remember, but I did look at this by a notebook so that I'm not just writing on scraps of paper. I could be more legitimate and take the notes of what was asked and who asked it. So trust me, I will not be forgetting in the future because I've forgotten who made these great recommendations on several occasions. Though I do want to say, I just opened this and not to digress too much, but uh, I bought this notebook. It's got a nice cover. It's got a, a thing to get my page. And if you look very closely at the pages, it's dots? Like what? <laughs> what is that? Why don't you just put lines in? Who needs dots? It's not even graph paper. It's just dots. I'll use it anyway. Sorry for complaining. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Um, before we go, John Nixon would go on, uh, continue as an officer, like I said, fighting the war. And then he became very important in banking. So, uh, John Nixon, as I said, was a wealthy merchant. And when the Continental Army and the Continental Congress were going flat broke, and these Continentals they created were valueless, they needed some money. So, uh, John Nixon got with many other uh, wealthy Philadelphians, and they created what more or less was the first American bank. There were other banks and, and, and state banks, but this was the first one to sponsor all of America, at least all of its army and all of its Continental Congress. And it was called the Bank of Pennsylvania. Now, this bank only lasted a year, but it did help to fund the American Revolution, and John Nixon was appointed as its first director. He was the first director of the first more or less central bank. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, this bank was replaced the following year by the Bank of North America, which was privately charted, uh, and, and he did help, Nixon did help create the Bank of North America and help charter it um, and, and, and helped it along for several years. But uh, a different person, I believe it was Thomas Willing. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe Thomas Willing took over as director. Um, I should look that up. Uh, for about a decade, and he kind of stepped back, and and uh, John Nixon went back to private life. But in 1792, Thomas Willing went over to the newly created bank, uh, first bank of the United States that Alexander Hamilton had created. Hamilton also had created the Bank of New York in the 1780s. But then, once the Treasury Department gets established under the new government, Hamilton creates the first bank of the United States. So, John Nixon comes back in and takes over as director of the Bank of North America. And these three banks, the Bank of North America, the First Bank of the United States, and the Bank of New York, were the first three 
banks traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Whether you like big banks and the New York Stock Exchange, that's a different conversation. Again, no modern politics here. But it is a momentous occasion in history. I mean, look at how we treat, again, not to talk about modern politics, but look at how the stock market is viewed compared to the economy today. That's because of these three banks, one of which, the Bank of North America, was directed by John Nixon. So if you guys have any questions, now would be the time. Whoa, we got some questions. Uh, may have had a monkey. Oh, you keep bringing this up. I sorry, uh, 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 Mr. Nyland has reminded me that Eliza Jumel may have had a monkey. I, I could not confirm it, but I did see it in several places. So, uh, she may very well have had a monkey, just to add to her fascinating life. Uh, I'm sure there's a ton I even wrote about and left out. There were a bunch of things I didn't couldn't squeeze into the article. Look up Eliza Jumel. She has an absolutely fascinating life. Uh, Mr. Muscleman read that Hamilton told Burr, I'm sorry life's hard without your wife, and was like, whoa man, chill, and then looked up and found out Theodosia died of stomach cancer. Um, so, if, I, if I'm with you, if I'm with you, Mr. Muscleman, uh, he was... Uh, being rude about his wife and didn't know she was dead yet? That's tough. That's tough. I'm not aware of that particular interaction. Hi, TJ. Welcome. Thank you um, for coming. TJ, one of my great patriots on Patreon. If you guys want to support this channel, which I would really appreciate, uh, you can either go to my shop in the store below. That helps. Or become a Patreon, a patriot on Patreon. Link below. I put out a bunch of extra content. I'm putting out something in the next day or so. Um, so please come, TJ. One of my fascinating... Uh, fascinating... One of the words in my head. One of my tremendous patrons wasn't me either. I'm learning these people from watching these videos. Well, thank you. I'm glad I can help you learn. Uh, have you done a video of the Compromise of 1790? I don't see too much about it. I would like to see what you have to say, what you think of it. The Compromise of 1790. I'm um, not entirely sure what you're referencing there. Oh, are you talking about um, uh, the dinner where, where Burr and... Uh, I'm sorry, not Burr. Uh, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton had dinner and decided on the Treasury Department, or decided on the location of the Capitol. I believe that's the compromise you're referencing. There were several compromises. Um, they used to compromise, imagine that. <laughs> um, so, in short, the Compromise of 1790 is Burr Hamilton wanted to start this Treasury Department, assume the debts, create literally the United States we have today, uh, was created by Alexander Hamilton because of his things in the Treasury Department. And in return, the Virginians got the capital in Maryland. <laughs> um, I, it is It was supposed to be part of Virginia too, but it just never happened. Um, I, I'm always surprised by the fa how easily they let this slide. Now, Jefferson had only just returned from France and was trying to be objective about the situation and was, as Secretary of the State, trying to be more concerned about international and domestic affairs than this disagreement between essentially the House of Representatives and the Treasury Department. So uh, Madison, I I'm so surprised he kind of caved on the whole thing so easily, but you also have to keep in mind, while Madison and Hamilton ended up kind of being nemesis because when Jefferson came back, Madison started siding with Jefferson and Jefferson didn't like Hamilton. Uh, but while Jefferson was in France, it was a young James Madison and a young Alexander Hamilton in their early 30s who became friends in the Continental Congress and then knew something had to be done and they called the Annapolis Convention and not a lot got done and then they're the ones who essentially called together the Constitutional Convention. And then these two men worked together with John Jay to write the Federalist Papers and to convince New York but also convince all of these young states to join as one country. These two men worked very closely together for several years, and then all of a sudden their government was there, and they were ready to govern, and they were like, whoa, we disagree with each other on everything. <laughs> you know, hold on. And, and, and as they actually say in the play, Hamilton, like, Hamilton essentially went to Jefferson and was like, I need your help. Like, I can't, we need to get, we need to do something with the Treasury Department. I think this is the best way to go about it. Can you at least help me talk to Madison? And essentially, as they say in the play, we will never know what happens in the room. But you know what? Let me pause real quick and grab a book. This is not the book I was going to recommend this week. 
it's it's not. There's a link below for a different book. I'll say it after this. But Founding Brothers. This was the book that got me into the American Revolution. It's by Joseph J. Ellis. It's a very easy read. If you're new to the American Revolution, or even if you're all hand of the Revolution, it talks about, I believe, six, if not seven, I think it's six. Let me make sure. I don't want to be a liar. Six, I was right. Uh, different events of the American Revolution. And what, what Joseph Ellis believes are the six most important turning points of the American Revolution, of which one is uh, the dinner, as he likes to call it. Uh, another one it actually is the duel, <laughs> um, which also involves Alexander Hamilton. Um, I highly recommend everyone read this book. And if you know anyone younger who's curious about getting into the American Revolution, like Muscle Man, you mentioned you were a little bit younger than most of our viewers, uh, see if you can get your hands on a copy of this book. It, it, it's just a really basic, easy way into the revolution by looking at people as people, having dinner or getting in a duel. And it talks a lot, of, a lot about who they were more than the politics they were fighting for, although, of course, that underlines the whole thing. So I, I highly recommend this book. This was the first book. I had read history and been a history nerd, but this is the book that went from being a casual history fan to, like, oh, I'm going to spend the next 20 years researching the American Revolution. I'll make a YouTube channel about it one day. Um, although I do have a link down below. So I, I like to recommend a book every week, and this week I am recommending Gordon S. Wood's Revolutionary Characters. Now, if you know the name Gordon, Gordon Wood, it's from... Goodwill Hunting. Do you remember the movie Goodwill Hunting? And there's like, how about them apples? You remember that? Well, you might not remember that what the name they say is, I've been reading Gordon Wood. And they're referencing this book by Gordon Wood. Radicalism of the American Revolution. It won a Pulitzer Prize. It's an amazing work. American historians look at Gordon Wood as the American historian. I can't speak for everyone, but almost everyone looks at him that way. And this is the book. This book is really hard to read. It's super complicated. I'm not going to recommend this to you. It took me several times to get through it. I'm going to recommend this book, Revolutionary Characters, where he talks about what I like to call the big six, uh, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Hamilton, and Adams. He also actually has two other chapters on uh, Thomas Paine and Burr. And he talks about them. Gordon Wood likes to focus on the American Revolution as part of the Enlightenment, which is something I meant to say in my video about the Declaration the other day, it is like, this is the culmination of the Enlightenment. 200 years of rational, cold, logical thinking led to the American Revolution and French Revolution, one of which wasn't so great. <laughs> um, but uh, revolutionary characters, it, what, what made the founders different is the subtitle. And it talks about kind of their education, who they were as people, why they would think that republicanism is the right way to go when they grew up in generations of monarchy. So that's it for me today. I'm not going to keep you guys too long. Highly recommend those books. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you want to support me, you can become a patron, buy a shirt or a coffee mug down below, anything like that. We really appreciate all your support. Um, if there are any more questions, now's the time. We're about to hit an hour. I'm starting to get a little sweaty. I really appreciate everyone being here. I'm going to take one sip of my coffee and see if anyone's got a question. Anyone? Huh? 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 Almost choked my coffee. Anyway, that seems to be it. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I do want to know for those of you still here, I've been trying to do a lot of live videos this week. I'm just testing it out because I notice people like live, but I usually like make my Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday videos pretty short. So uh, let me know what you think of those. I am going to do live tomorrow and Friday again. I've got a lot of viewers, got a lot of likes, more likes than usual, and that indicates you like it, but I do have some feedback that say they like the more standardized videos too. So let me know. I'm open to this. This is I've been doing it since September, but it's still pretty new to me. So I, I just want to make uh, you guys happy and, and, and give you the best content I possibly can. So please let me know. Um, I saw that Burr was a founding father, though he never did anything significant for the government, as far as I know, and didn't sign the declaration. Is that true? Well, muscle man... Uh, he was the third vice president of the United States of America, and he was a United States senator during the George Washington administration. So, while he did not necessarily do one thing that stands out above the rest, he was most certainly, from my perspective, part of the American founding. Now, the words founding father uh, are very specific words. Uh, certain people will say, you know, the only, the only founding fathers are the big six. Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, Madison, Hamilton. Six. Uh... Other people will say, you know, you sign the Declaration of Independence, you're a founder. But then there are a bunch of people 
Hamilton didn't sign the Declaration of Independence. George Washington didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, but they did sign the Constitution. But then Thomas Jefferson and John Adams didn't sign the Constitution. They were in France at that time, or in Europe at that time. So, when you define founding father, it's a wide range of definitions. Now, I refer to the word founder, and I've said this many times, I have an extremely broad definition of what an American founder is. Anyone who contributed to the founding of the United States, from my perspective, is an American founder. Even people like, uh, someone called me out on recently, Isaac Lowe, who helped start the revolution in New York City, part of the violence in early revolutionary New York City, led the Committee of 51 and the Committee of 100, that he was the chairman of those committees, which were the revolutionary committees in New York. And he went to the First Continental Congress and signed the Articles of uh, the, the Continental Association, which launched the boycott against British goods. And then he became a loyalist. Does he count as a founder? New York might not have joined the revolution the way they did without him. They probably would have, but it might have been different. I think he's a founder. I made him, I gave him a day. There are dozens of people who fall into these qualifications. So when you're asking about Aaron Burkhound as a founder, from my perspective, I mean, yeah. I mean, he's essentially the main character in the most popular play about the founding ever. <laughs> um, I, I would count him as a founder. He also, by the way, Burr uh, served in the revolution as a colonel. He uh, left his law practice, or was studying to be a lawyer, he wasn't even a lawyer yet, and left it behind to go join the war. He traveled through the Maine wilderness with uh, Benedict Arnold to go fight in Quebec, even though people had were bailing on that because they were starving to death. So I have a weird defense of Aaron Burr. He also would, you know, that he, he was tried for treason, but it wasn't even any of that. It wasn't the assassination. He actually went and tried to start another country in Mexico. Uh, and that's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, thanks for the stories this week. Thank you so much, Tara, for coming along. I really appreciate uh, you coming. Um, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, good night, TJ. Okay, you're going to start at the beginning. Okay, well, when you get back to here, <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh... Mr. Muscle Man, also, do you think you could figure out how to put your Hamilton screen on the video so we can watch what you're seeing during the watch parties? Okay, um, the thing is, is, like, if I put Hamilton on the screen, like, Disney can sue me, or, like, YouTube has automatic things that will flag me for putting up content that's not mine, uh, and then I can get the whole channel shut down. So, like, no, I'm sorry, man. Like, I really, really want to. I would love to, but, like... I'm a small channel, and putting up a Disney's most popular movie in decades would essentially get this whole good time destroyed. So I would love to, but I can't. That's why I do the countdown at the beginning. Um, this weekend, you know, on Sunday at 12 o'clock, we're going to do Act 2. Uh, and that's why I count down 3, 2, 1. I hope you have it. If not, then um, grab the uh, soundtrack and put that on headphones or something. Uh, again, I would really love to, but I can't. Um, although I am thinking about continuing this kind of thing with other shows, probably not on Sundays, this is a special event, these are very long, but, uh, maybe, like, the Adam, the John Adams miniseries, or, um, Turn, the Turn series, uh, maybe we do it on, like, Friday nights or something like that, or if there's a different weekday that you want to do, like, a live video like this, and, or, like, the one we did over the weekend, and just blah, blah, blah. Well, Muscle Man, so the audio is the problem. The video I could probably get away with, although I'm not going to risk it, the audio is what YouTube tracks, and they can flag that. It's why, you know, if I were to play, like, a popular song on my channel, I, they would get taken down because I'm stealing people's content. And, and I really don't want... I wouldn't want to do that. I know other people do it, and I watch other people's content doing things like that, too. Don't know how they get away with it. Don't want... Just, I mean, it's not like it's anyone I'd be stealing from. It's Disney, and Disney seems to be the worst with that kind of thing. So, uh, I, I, again, I would really love to, man. I apologize that I can't. Um, but if you have Disney Plus, I want to put it on. Or again, if you have the soundtrack, it's on Spotify. Just pop it on. Uh, hopefully it would be similar. Um, any other questions? I'm happy to talk. I love it. I could obviously talk at length forever about the American Revolution. Um, but I am getting pretty sweaty, so I'm, I'm going to do what I did last time. I'm take one more drink. And see if anything pops up. And if not, I'll bid you adieu. Ooh. Coffee at 9.15. <laughs> yeah. That's how I can talk so much at this hour. <laughs>
I don't drink coffee all day on Wednesdays and I have it like at like eight o'clock and then it gets super cold. It's awesome. Anyway, that seems to be it. Thank you all so much for watching. Again, I can't appreciate you guys signing up more. I've had so much growth in the last two weeks. It, it is unfathomable to me. Uh, if you guys really like what I'm doing, the biggest thing you can do to help is hit like before you go. If you're new here, which if you're an hour and a half in, you're probably not new, hit subscribe. Um, but if you want to share it, that would be amazing. Not necessarily this video, but one of my shorter videos, maybe the one I put out tomorrow. If you want to just share it on any social media app you have, that would just mean the whole world to me. All right, guys. So I'm going to go Matthew Nyland with Round Bottom. I was thinking about changing Round Bottom to um, I am your uh, uh, humble and obedient servant, which is how they all used to end their letters. I know it sounds weird today, but you know what? I will say Round Bottom. And TJ, I can sleep. Don't you worry. My kids keep me up all night. So it doesn't matter. All right, guys. Uh, round bottom. I am your humble and obedient servant. You guys have a great night. And I'll be back with a video for you tomorrow. Thank you again.